started, I noticed in the meeting um, a couple of you were talking about finding out about shows to apply for. <laughs> um, the show that my work is in in London is the BP Portrait Award. They do it every year. Um, it's a great opportunity to possibly get to show in the National Portrait Gallery in London. Um, and there's a wide variety of work. So if any of you are portrait artists, you might want to check it out. You can just Google BP Portrait Award. And I think the submissions are open now till December. So that was how that happened for me. I just, my, my uh, friend convinced me that I had to submit. So but I did. And Emily, <laughs> she didn't say how few portraits in figurative work were included in jury into the show. Wasn't it like 60 or 80? It, um, so they're all, yeah, they're all portraits. And there were, I think, 41 that Out of were over 2,000. Yeah. They've really been expanding the variety of work that they choose because they've uh, usually had a lot of very traditional type work and they still show that very, very representational, but now they're showing a wider variety. So it's fun to see every year if you like portraits. Um, what I'll be doing today is a charcoal portrait drawing. It is semi unconventional. I like to walk the line between representation and abstraction. Um, I'm interested in what is real and in front of me, and also the mood and the feeling of that. So I don't necessarily walk a traditional path. I kind of pull in everything that I like. Um, I, I'm going to pass around this book. Um, I did a show a couple years ago with uh, 40 portraits um, that were all done from life of people in Albuquerque and made this book that has some examples of it. So this is a sample one just if you're interested in taking a look at some of my work. And then for today, um, I'm not a very quick drawer, so we'll see how much I get done. Um, I'm definitely going to show you how I start a charcoal drawing and we'll just see how far I go. Um, I would like to draw one of you. Um, I'm interested in drawing regular people. I find all of you very fascinating. Um, so anyone that feels like they can sit for 30 minutes would be great. You'd like to do it? Great. Okay, yes, yes. Perfect. Um, and what's your name? Terry. Terry, nice to meet you. Hi. Um, do you normally work in pastel? Yes. That's your main thing? Okay, great. Yes. Have a seat. Yes. But probably more color than you're going to use. <laughs> yes. Today, just black yeah. and white. Um, so you can just be comfortable because I'm going to talk for a few minutes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, I'll warm up. <laughs> <laughs> well, everyone stares at you. Just relax. Um, I'm going to start my drawing with vine charcoal. Uh, I like it because it's... Uh, almost sculptural in the way that you can apply it and wipe it off. Um, generally, I spend at least an hour with the vine charcoal. I'm going to see if I can push myself to move a little quicker today. Um, I also use these erasers, and I don't know what they're called. I just call them the click erasers. Um, and they're not a traditional drawing tool, but I absolutely love them. This really tiny one, sometimes they have it at Artisans, and maybe if more people request them, they'll have them more because it is wonderful. Um, and I use these as a drawing tool as well. And so what are they called again? I don't know what they're called. Pentel, oh it is called a click eraser. Click eraser. Because you click how much eraser you want. And the small one has the name worn off, but small, <laughs> small click eraser. Um, <laughs> I also use just the peel and sketch charcoal in a softer medium, and I don't really bring this in until I'm about halfway through the drawing. Um, and I like this because you can get some darker darks and more detail than with the vine charcoal. Um, and I sharpen it, I have one of these today, but usually I just use uh, sandpaper from Lowe's or Home Depot or something to sharpen my charcoal. And paper. Oh, the paper is Stonehenge printmaking paper. Um, it's 100% rag paper. I'm really attached to it. It does not have a lot of tooth. It has some, but it is a more smooth paper. Um, and I think I just like to challenge myself with that. Um, but yes, it's wonderful. And 
I just have it taped to a piece of glass that uh, I've been using because it's the right size. So <laughs> that's not a tip, it just works for me. Um, so when I work with someone, I want you to be as comfortable as possible, even though I have you in this stressful situation. <laughs> so, I don't feel stressed. <laughs> great. Great. I picked the right person, Terry. Um, so I'm going to have you scoot forward maybe six inches, if you don't mind. Okay. I think that'll work great. Um, and you might have noticed I do not have any fancy lighting on Terry. This is also a personal quirk of mine that I, I like the challenge of having um, soft lighting or just dealing with the circumstances because I'm, I'm partial to real life instead of a setup. Um, so we're going to work with the natural light and then I'm going to have you either look at something right past me. I know there's not a lot going on back there, but just so that you can remember how you're sitting. Okay. Um, and do you feel comfortable sitting like that? You go like that. <laughs> how, however you want, if you think you can hold that position for a while. Okay. And I'm going to set a timer so that I don't make you sit more than 30 minutes without a break because I don't want to torture anyone. <laughs> So could you pick something a little bit higher, closer to me, like you're staring through my forehead, maybe? Oh, oh, okay. Yeah. Sort of How does that? You. Yeah, yeah. Does that work? Okay. I'm, I Which might move. Right, so you might right have to... at you or right behind you? Oh, I see. Okay. I got yeah. It. In case you move. Yeah, behind me in case I'm. That is perfect. Thanks. All right. <laughs> So I'm, I start with a, a very rough block in, and I'm a messy drawer, so I really don't worry too much about being too careful at the beginning. Um, I'm okay with the process showing that's part of what is interesting to me. So for portraiture, um, I start with the basic shape of the head and then a general idea of where the eye sockets are. So instead of the actual eyeball, I think of the, the cheekbone to the brow bone and I'm just getting a rough idea of where that is. And that is important because it ensures that um, once you do get to the eyes, they're going to be setting in the person's face instead of on top of their face. And I also like to really emphasize um, all of the structure, the, the shapes that are present on the skin um, and save mm -hmm. a lot of my details till last. So I don't think that I can talk and draw <laughs> the whole time. I can, but um, if anyone has a question, I am open to that. So as we're going, feel free to. Could you tell us a little bit about your background? Did you study art or self-taught? Um, I have a bachelor's in fine art from the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. Huh? Um, if any of you have art degrees, you probably know that they don't cover technique in a <laughs> fine art program anymore. They do a little bit um, in your foundations courses, but a lot of it is about concept, which I also think is valuable. Um, but a lot of my actual um, technique, I guess I would say it's self-taught or from just watching artists that I admire work. And something that I also think has helped me a lot is that I art modeled in the past, um, which was really fun and interesting. And it, it gave me a sense of where I wanted to go with my work. Because I noticed art modeling that I wasn't really myself. I was being an object for the audience, um, which was fun. But when I'm making work, I, I really like uh, trying my best to capture something about the 
the person themselves. So I learned that from that experience and also the importance of breaks. <laughs> <laughs> And seated poses. <laughs> yes, and seated poses. I do like unusual poses, but I use photo reference for that because I, I don't want to torture anyone. Um, when I use a photo reference, I like to sketch the person first. I really love to go to their home or a place that they feel comfortable at. Um, my painting that's in the BP show in London um, of Devetta, she's a local woman, she told me I should meet her at the senior center. She didn't want me to come to her house. <laughs> so I met her at the senior center and I sketched for quite a while and I usually do that um, to help people relax because we all have our face that we like to show the world and I'm more interested in our natural face when we're at ease and maybe not so self-conscious. Um, and I feel like sketching people can kind of drop that mask a little bit so that by the time I start taking my reference photos, um, I get less of those cement, cement smiles and a more natural at ease kind of feel. Your drawing seems very light. Are you using a hard charcoal or just a soft touch? I'm using a very soft touch um, and it's a vine charcoal. I don't I don't know if it's what the hardness is on it, um, but I like to start relief really light so I can figure out my my uh, arrangement of features. And I'm also very process oriented. So even though um, Terry, Terry is so kindly sitting for me, I think about accuracy and in, you know enjoying finding shapes, but I don't really concern myself with getting a likeness. I just let that come through the process of working. And the drawing can change a lot from, from beginning to end. that are interested in portraits in particular um, I try to keep in mind just general facial proportions um, I don't get overly labored in that by drawing out a diagram but general proportions like the eyes are usually near the middle of the skull the nose is usually the shadow of the nose is usually between the eyes and the chin, and the mouth is between the nose and the chin. Um, if someone is sitting and looking at you straight on the way Terry is today. Have you done self-portraits? Yes. <laughs> um, I got a little sick of myself. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have previously done a lot of self-portraits, and I probably will do more. Um, I just started getting way more interested in other people and how, uh, how unique we all are, how individual, not just our features, but how individual our gestures are and what that could say about us as people. Um, So that's why I've been, I mean, maybe I don't want to know that much about myself. I've been veering <laughs> away from the, the self-portraits. So once I've got the features in, as you can see, they're really, really rough. Um, I start outlining the shapes that I find 
in the skin um, to get a skin texture and to give the drawing some uh, a more three-dimensional feel um, and drawing in the shapes of the skin also gives me something to work with when I bring in the eraser because I use that eraser to create a lot of the skin texture so I need something I need something there to remove and blend How are you doing? All right. Okay. Um, other proportional cues that are pretty basic. Um, sometimes the edges of the nose line up with the corners of the eyes. Um, when I was drawing in Wisconsin, I thought that that rule just applied to everyone. But now that I'm here in New Mexico, <laughs> it's so great, totally different faces. Um, and uh, I think most people here, their noses are a little bit wider. So it's been fun to notice that. Um, and then additionally, the corners of the mouth sometimes line up with the center of their eye. Where will your residency be that uh, award? It's at the Helen Wurlitzer Foundation in Taos. Oh, it's in Taos? It, yeah, it's great because it's close. Mm -hmm. And it's almost three months long. <clears throat> and if anyone is interested in applying for that one, just mm -hmm. go on the Helen Wurlitzer website. Um, it is great because um, it's funded, so it's free to stay there. They provide your housing and your studio. and. You just have to, you know, provide your food and supplies and whatnot. And they also don't require a project description, so you can work on whatever you want. Okay, so I'm starting to lay in those skin shapes that I was talking about. And the light on Terry's face is really even, so I'm not going to have as many, uh, as much contrast as I might have with a different setup. And I like to, uh, this might be uh, my painterly sensibility, but I like to outline the shape to be somewhat precise about the shape I'm working with, and then fill it in. So even though I'm interested in concept and I for me I do think that's important to a finished piece when I look at art it's something I'm interested in when I'm working I really mostly address that with the setup like I set up the par parameters of picking someone I don't know from the audience and having non-specific lighting um, and I also sit um, I'm sitting to be at the same height as the person that I'm drawing when I paint I usually stand but I want to make sure that I'm not looking up or down at them, unless that's somehow relevant to the idea that I'm working with. So if you're standing, let me, then is your model standing also? So that you've got the same Heights. When, when I'm working from life, I do usually sit so that we're the same. Oh, okay. And when I'm painting, I'll work from oh, a photo okay. reference okay. Or, or something else. I just, since I don't use professional models, 
I am. I don't want somebody to pass out on me. I just couldn't make someone stand for that long. That, um, the viewpoint of looking at the model is something that I think is really important and sometimes not considered with um, artists that are somewhat new to portraiture. I don't know if any of you saw the show that I had at Harwood um, last year. The painting of Devetta was part of that show. And for those paintings, I was below all of the women that I painted because I wanted a, a majestic, powerful kind of feel, like showing regular people that you might pass on the street as someone that is important and secretly powerful and worth, worth noticing and taking an interest in. Are you a blender or a math blender? <laughs> I was me, my fingers would be all over that already. <laughs> I am, I almost hate to, I am an adamant anti blender. That's a new art term. But, <laughs> but not 100% because I do a lot of my blending with the eraser. Um, I avoid blending, especially at the beginning, because I, it makes me focus on the, the accuracy of my shapes and not get too fussy. I like a sense of rawness and just responding to the moment in a drawing, and blending, I feel, can sometimes hinder that. Um, and I also think of blending as a final detail sort of aspect. Um, in charcoal, or in pastels too, I mean, you can always, there's always opportunity to soften later. Your hair is just too fun, I could <laughs> keep working on your beautiful hair all day. Great job. <laughs> With her beautiful hair. We've all ended her hair. So. <laughs> so I'm thinking about combining accuracy and um, and looseness. It's like a there's a tension there that I really like between keeping a drawing loose um, but still being somewhat accurate in your representation of the subject. And especially at the, be the beginning in this like vine charcoal phase. I shoot for loose accuracy. <laughs> <laughs> That's the next show. <laughs> <laughs> Lose accuracy. <laughs> Another thing that I'm looking for is finding the straight lines within a curve. Um, a curve seems so simple but it can be really challenging to draw accurately. I feel like our eyes just can get caught up in the details of a curve and lose the, the big picture. So I'm always looking for what straight lines can make up the curve. Um, even in the pupil of the eye, I think of making an angled shape. Or the iris of the eye.
when you first started mm -hmm. painting portraits, did you start with photographs of people or, or live models, or how did you get going with it or develop your skill in this initially? That's a very good question. Um, well, I've always been very interested in people, so even in, as a kid or in high school or middle school, I drew people um, from photographs and from life also, just um, pretty much whatever was available mm -hmm. is what I would work with. Um, I got more interested in working from life in college just because the challenge was so great. And it ended up being really significant for me because um, this was kind of one of those wonderful, weird things that happen in life. Um, I have an older sister who was really struggling with addiction and a lot of problems at the time. And she's 15 years older than me. So even though I always admired her, we were never super close. And I asked her to sit for a really large painting, which maybe is the first serious portrait that I had ever done. And you know, she, like, she rolled out of bed and showed up. So she had this crazy messy hair and she had slept with her hair in braids. And I said, well, you're gonna have to, we're gonna have 10 more sittings and you're gonna have to have your hair like that every time, so now you're, you've committed to braiding your hair the night before. <laughs> um, and we really connected through the process of me making that drawing. We're really, she's doing much better. <laughs> We're really close now, and it just showed me how you can get to know a person in a completely different way by drawing them, someone that you've known your whole life. Um, you see them differently when you're drawing. Um, they can relax in a different way around you that they might not otherwise. And it's very intimate experience, not just for the person being observed. I mean, how often do we have someone sit and really look at us? Um, almost never. So that is um, always brave on the part of the sitter. But also they're seeing you in a vulnerable place of um, making work and not knowing what's going to happen and taking a risk with their face, which is very personal. <laughs> um, so that trust, I think, is really powerful and just important in general and why, why I love doing portraits. All the people that I've drawn since then have been people that I, I wanted to get to know and found interesting. So after that painting of my sister, I ended up doing a bunch of paintings of her. Um, and I just decided yesterday that I'm going to force her <laughs> to sit for me again. So to be continued, the, the family portrait series. So I would like to get a little bit more into the features to, um, and their placement, but I want you to see how I go about um, creating the, the texture of the skin. So I'm going to jump to that a little bit.
So I'm creating almost a mosaic, like an overlapping mosaic of shapes to describe the structure of the face. So when I teach, um, I teach at Harwood some painting classes and some portrait drawing classes. And one of the most common questions I get is, um, how are you not afraid to start? Like, how do you start jumping into the blank piece of paper? And for me, one of the secrets is just not being afraid to make a mess, being willing to have things be in the wrong place and move them later. And as far as features go, in drawing, I've decided that my absolute favorite features are chins <laughs> and um, this lower, our lower eyelid, which unfortunately seem to be the things that people don't like about their face. <laughs> um, but I just love them because they say so much about us and our our mood and the way we hold ourselves in the world. Um, and they're also very subtle forms. Like the chin is not really a line, it's a, a degree of different values. Um, so it's nice to find a lot of different shapes in a chin instead of thinking of it in terms of lines. And I hope that someone, I hope at least one person is inspired <laughs> to go try out a portrait, maybe even a charcoal portrait after this. Um, now obviously a chair works fine, but when I work in my studio, I sit on a yoga ball. <laughs> um, and I hate it because they're so ugly, but um, it's really easy to injure yourself when you're focused on your drawing, as I'm sure a lot of you have noticed. So that has been a big back and neck saver for me. In the last newsletter from the Pastel Society, there was a whole listing of places people could go to do uh, figure drawings. Great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the Harwood has one Friday night. There's a really great one on 3rd Street. I haven't been in a really long time, but I think that's Wednesday. There's one every single night of the week. Well, in the, uh, the artist studio in the Hoffman Town Shopping Center, we have two every week and they're in the morning. That's where I know you from. Ah, I modeled there. Yep. Okay. Yep. <laughs> it might have been 10 years ago, but I, re I remember now. Yes. Your work is beautiful. Good memory then. I was amazed to see such a lengthy list of different places for, um, for portrait drawing. I didn't realize there was so much going on with that. There are really a lot. And um, Suva. I think that stands yes, for... they were in the list, too. Theirs is free. Um, Which one is that? It's on Thursday nights. It's at Suva, S-U-V-A. And it's a, a small art college. It seems like it has a real different mix of people than the other groups. Other than those letter before it disappears. Next one comes out. <laughs> Yeah, the last time I went to a Suva drawing group, they had the model in high waist underwear holding a lightsaber. It was really, really fun.
And we've just got a few more minutes till we take a break. Are you still doing okay? Mm -hmm. Another note about features is um, when I think about drawing the mouth, I consider the, the whole area from under their nose to where that lower lip um, divots in, um, in order to, um, to show it as a, as a shape instead of just a, a like a drawn on lipstick mouth um, <clears throat> and especially drawing someone from life it's pretty easy to avoid that under nose to top of lip area because um, what will our model think if we shade too dark and accidentally give them a mustache but I say <laughs> I haven't given you a mustache um, I say go for it because you can always continue to work the drawing and a lot of times that's what uh, really brings that three-dimensionality to the face. Okay, I want to keep going, but I'm going to let you stand up and stretch to get a little break. Um, any other questions right now? I have one. Yeah. It's very scary to, to draw a portrait, I think, for me anyway. Because I drew my two girls, and all I got was a bunch of black. They don't look like that. Their hair's not that color. <laughs> you know, and I wonder if you ever did this. That's not me. That's not me. That's something I really thought about a lot. Um, and yes, I have had that happen. Um, and I did not say this to you, but generally, <laughs> I tell a person, just so you know, this drawing really doesn't mean anything about you. It might look like you, it might not, but it does not mean anything about how I think about you or how you really look or are in the world. We're just doing this weird thing of me observing your face and seeing what happens. Um, so I get them to agree to that. And, <laughs> that's right, you do too. Yeah. yeah, I get some agreement before I start, and also that is the reason that I like to draw people I don't know, because the emotional connection with people that are close can be really rough. Like, don't do your family, right? Well, yeah. you did your sister. My sister worked great because, um, well, she's very direct if she doesn't like something. But <laughs> <laughs> she she accepted the conditions. Yeah, my mom won't accept the conditions, so I don't have to sign. I'm also okay with the person not liking the drawing. I mean, really, that's fine with me, and I think that's important when you're working with people. Like, it's okay if. It's okay if they don't like it. Um, was that enough of a break um, for you? All right. I never get to sit still. This is kind of <laughs> <laughs> meditative. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really dying to keep going with the vine charcoal um, and make this a very finished drawing, but I, I am gonna, I am gonna try to push myself to, to move on to the next phase. And I did pick this head on uh, pose to emphasize that, uh, to kind of remove that voyeuristic thing that happens a lot in drawings of people. I like the, it to feel like you're interacting with the subject when you look at the work, even if they're not really there, um, as opposed to just taking a, a peek in on someone without them actually 
actively participating. Mm I'm working on getting some charcoal just down on the paper um, on the skin so that I have something to work with with my eraser. I'm sure you do the same thing. Start with the, the bigger tool first to get big shapes. Um, and I still think about shapes and filling as I work with that eraser. So you're using the eraser? Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. In, in the same way that I use the vine charcoal, um, and if I were completing this as a finished drawing, I might be going back and forth between the vine charcoal and the eraser <laughs> as I work. So I'm erasing and blending at the same time mm -hmm. and thinking about it in terms of shape. generally not always the most beautiful stage of the drawing um, but the back and forth of erasing and then going in with the peel and sketch charcoal afterwards um, just gets a really beautiful skin like texture and adds a lot of uh, has layers and complexity to the drawing charcoal I usually make a decision at the beginning um, that if I'm gonna work with color I just I just jump in with the color right from the beginning uh -huh. so what do you what, what do you use for the color um well when I'm, I paint in oil paints mostly so my paintings are oil or acrylic um, in the past I had done a lot of pastel drawings, but I really haven't done any recently. <laughs> Do you find there's a difference, a, a big difference between doing it from a photo or a real life? I try to look at them the same way. I try to think of it as the same process of finding shapes. Um, And I think it's important whenever possible to work from a reference that I took myself and set up with some intention um, that helps it be more similar to working from life. But in real life, the person is always gonna move. I mean, they're, they're not a rock, they're human. So that adds a, a fun, interesting aspect of it. The lighting always changes. And so I guess it's a little bit more dynamic working from 
life than from a photo reference. Is it always on a white base? Mm. Um, For your charcoal. Yes. Uh, by the time I'm halfway through, it's there's so much going on that it kind of is more of a mid-tone. But I do, I generally start with, a, with white. Any other questions? Can we see the portrait you got in the BP show in London? Absolutely. I would be happy to show okay. you. can't go any further with this. The, um, the buying charcoal stops laying down nicely and you can't really get detail. So that's when I'd switch. So if I were working on this on my own, I wouldn't switch now, but I will. I will now for you guys. <laughs> um, I'm sharpening my charcoal with the um, sandpaper. And I usually make it just kind of, not necessarily a point, but a flat wedge. Um, and I hold it the same way I do the vine charcoal, or you'd hold a pastel or anything. Um, and the drawing really changes with the peel and sketch because the, um, well, really the color of the charcoal is different. and the amount of control that's available. But I still, um, after I've laid it in with the peel and sketch charcoal, I still go with the, do another roundabout with the eraser. Um, and then charcoal again. So some interesting things that have come out of these charcoal drawings was I got a commission to do uh, drawings of all the people that worked at, at this investment banking firm for their website. And it was really interesting because I was working from the photos they provided, professional headshots. And <laughs> All of the details on the women's faces were blown out. <laughs> it was just painful. Well, the men were mostly there. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so it was interesting to try to find tiny bits of what might be real and add it back in. And then I also had a commission for an, another company to do these on a whiteboard with a dry erase marker. Oh. With, yeah. So that was a really exciting challenge too, to translate. Did you get the same effect doing it with the dry eraser on the board? Um, I tried and it wasn't 100%, but it was really interesting. Instead of the eraser, I just um, like rolled up some tissue and tried to approach it the same way. You can't build up that dry erase ink very much. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but it did it did work and I was really grateful for that opportunity to try something so crazy.
You don't have much of a shadow under your nose with this lighting. Kind of different than So the, the fine, the tiny eraser, I'm usually leaving till I get to my final details, like getting some highlights in around the eyes or under the nose. And I really scrub the paper too. It's something that I love about this Stonehenge paper is it, it holds up. And when it stops working, then, then that's as far as you go. That's it. <laughs> Any other questions in our last? Couple of minutes. How did you exhibit the, the collection of your charcoals? Um, that was a challenge because uh, I wanted to. I, I sandwiched them back to back between two <coughs> sheets of plexiglass and hung them from the ceiling in a spiral. Mm -hmm. And I stitched each of them with pink thread that kind of connected all the drawings together. So I was really happy with the final presentation. It really did work nice, but um, but obviously it's, it's difficult to, but I don't think that plexiglass thing would hold up for a long term. They have to be framed. Did you hand stitch or use a sewing machine? I used a sewing machine. Okay. Which was maybe the most fun part because it, yeah, it feels reckless. Like you have this finished drawing that I was happy with and, all right, here we go. Load it into the sewing machine. <laughs> <laughs> they all survived it. Do you use any spray fixative? I do. I just use your basic, I, I use a workable fixative a lot because I'm always afraid I might want to work on it more. And that is an issue with the plexiglass, if anyone thinks about doing that, um, is that charcoal and pastel will static cling to your mm -hmm. plexiglass. So I don't recommend that one either. Yeah. So yeah? <laughs> yeah. When you do your oils, do you do a charcoal underdrawing? Um, never. <laughs> I, I never do a charcoal underdrawing. I do an underpainting, um, usually an umber, just with the oil paint, and sometimes with acrylic. But I, uh, I feel like drawing and then painting over it can easily start to turn into like paint by number or filling it in and it loses some of the freshness of just working with the materials right from the start. But I do draw them first separately, just in a sketchbook. It is. I think we might be done. Do you mind if I take a picture of you in case I feel like I need to? <laughs> All right, so just keep staring past me like you were. I'm a terrible photographer, so I'm going to just snap a whole bunch and hope for the best. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, thank you.
thank you all for coming. Um, if you have any other questions, feel free to come on.